Chapter 4, Part 3 of Queen Victoria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Queen Victoria by Giles Lytton Strachey. Chapter 4, Part 3. 5. The husband was not so happy as the wife. In spite of the great improvement in his situation, in spite of a growing family and the adoration of Victoria, Albert was still a stranger in a strange land, and the serenity of spiritual satisfaction was denied him. It was something, no doubt, to have dominated his immediate environment, but it was not enough, and besides, in the very completeness of his success there was a bitterness. Victoria idolized him but it was understanding that he craved for, not idolatry. And how much did Victoria, filled to the brim though she was with him, understand him? How much does the bucket understand the well? He was lonely. He went to his organ and improvised with learned modulations until the sounds, swelling and subsiding through elaborate cadences, brought some solace to his heart. Then, with the elasticity of youth, he hurried off to play with the babies, or to design a new pigsty, or to read aloud the church history of Scotland to Victoria, or to pirouette before her on one toe like a ballet dancer with a fixed smile, to show her how she ought to behave when she appeared in public places. Thus did he amuse himself, but there was one distraction in which he did not indulge. He never flirted. No, not with the prettiest ladies of the court. When during their engagement the Queen had remarked with pride to Lord Melbourne that the Prince paid no attention to any other woman, the cynic had answered, No, that sort of thing is apt to come later, upon which she had scolded him severely, and then hurried off to Stockmar to repeat what Lord M. had said. But the Baron had reassured her though in other cases he had replied that might happen, he did not think it would in Albert's. And the Baron was right. Throughout their married life no rival female charms ever had cause to give Victoria one moment's pang of jealousy. What more and more absorbed him, bringing with it a curious comfort of its own, was his work. With the advent of Peel, he began to intervene actively in the affairs of the state, in more ways than one, in the cast of their intelligence, in their moral earnestness, even in the uneasy formalism of their manners, the two men resembled each other. There was a sympathy between them, and thus Peel was ready enough to listen to the advice of Stockmar and to urge the prince forward into public life. A royal commission was about to be formed to inquire whether advantage might not be taken of the rebuilding of the Houses of Parliament to encourage the fine arts in the United Kingdom, and Peel, with great perspicacity, asked the Prince to preside over it. The work was of a kind which precisely suited Albert, his love of art, his love of method, his love of coming into contact, close yet dignified, with distinguished men. It satisfied them all, and he threw himself into it con amore. Some of the members of the commission were somewhat alarmed when, in his opening speech, he pointed out the necessity of dividing the subjects to be considered into categories. The word, they thought, smacked dangerously of German metaphysics. But their confidence returned when they observed His Royal Highness's extraordinary technical acquaintance with the processes of fresco painting. When the question arose as to whether the decorations upon the walls of the new building should or should not have a moral purpose, the Prince spoke strongly for the affirmative. Although many, he observed, would give but a passing glance to the works, the painter was not therefore to forget that others might view them with more thoughtful eyes. This argument convinced the commission, and it was decided that the subjects to be depicted should be of an improving nature. The frescoes were carried out in accordance with the commission's instructions, but unfortunately before very long they had become, even to the most thoughtful eyes, totally invisible. 
It seems that His Royal Highness's technical acquaintance with the processes of fresco painting was incomplete. The next task upon which the Prince embarked was a more arduous one. He determined to reform the organization of the royal household. This reform had been long overdue. For years past, the confusion, discomfort, and extravagance in the royal residences and in Buckingham Palace particularly had been scandalous. No reform had been practicable under the rule of the Baroness, but her functions had now devolved upon the Prince, and in 1844 he boldly attacked the problem. Three years earlier, Stockmar, after careful inquiry, had revealed in an elaborate memorandum an extraordinary state of affairs. The control of the household, it appeared, was divided in the strangest manner between a number of authorities, each independent of the other, each possessed of vague and fluctuating powers, without responsibility and without coordination. Of these authorities, the most prominent were the Lord Steward and the Lord Chamberlain, noblemen of high rank and political importance, who changed office with every administration, who did not reside with the court, and had no effective representatives attached to it. The distribution of their respective functions was uncertain and peculiar. In Buckingham Palace it was believed that the Lord Chamberlain had charge of the whole of the rooms, with the exception of the kitchen, sculleries, and pantries which were claimed by the Lord Steward. At the same time, the outside of the palace was under the control of neither of these functionaries, but of the Office of Woods and Forests, and thus, while the insides of the windows were cleaned by the department of the Lord Chamberlain, or possibly in certain cases of the Lord Steward, the Office of Woods and Forests cleaned their outsides. Of the servants, the housekeepers, the pages, and the housemaids were under the authority of the Lord Chamberlain. The clerk of the kitchen, the cooks, and the porters were under that of the Lord Steward. But the footmen, the livery porters, and the under-butlers took their orders from yet another official, the master of the horse. Naturally, in these circumstances, the service was extremely defective, and the lack of discipline among the servants disgraceful. They absented themselves for as long as they pleased, and whenever the fancy took them. And if, as the Baron put it, smoking, drinking, and other irregularities occur in the dormitories, where footmen, etc., sleep ten and twelve in each room, no one can help it. As for Her Majesty's guests, there was nobody to show them to their rooms, and they were often left, having utterly lost their way in the complicated passages, to wander helpless by the hour. The strange divisions of authority extended not only to persons, but to things. The Queen observed that there was never a fire in the dining-room. She inquired why. The answer was, The Lord Steward lays the fire, and the Lord Chamberlain lights it. The underlings of those two great noblemen having failed to come to an accommodation, there was no help for it. The Queen must eat in the cold. A surprising incident opened everyone's eyes to the confusion and negligence that reigned in the palace. A fortnight after the birth of the Princess Royal, the nurse heard a suspicious noise in the room next to the Queen's bedroom. She called to one of the pages, who, looking under a large sofa, perceived there a crouching figure with a most repulsive appearance. It was the boy Jones. This enigmatical personage, whose escapades dominated the newspapers for several ensuing months, and whose motives and character remained to the end ambiguous, was an undersized lad of seventeen, the son of a tailor, who had apparently gained admittance to the palace by climbing over the garden wall and walking in through an open window. Two years before he had paid a similar visit in the guise of a chimney-sweep. He now declared that he had spent three days in the palace, hiding under various beds, that he had helped himself to soup and other eatables, and that he had sat upon the throne, seen the queen, and heard the princess royal squall. Every detail of the strange affair was eagerly canvassed. The Times reported that the boy Jones had, from his infancy, been fond of reading, but that his countenance is exceedingly sullen. It added, 
the sofa under which the boy jones was discovered we understand is one of the most costly and magnificent material and workmanship and ordered expressly for the accommodation of the royal and illustrious visitors who call to pay their respects to her majesty the culprit was sent for three months to the house of correction when he emerged he immediately returned to buckingham palace he was discovered and sent back to the house of correction for another three months after which he was offered four pounds a week by a music hall to appear upon the stage he refused this offer and shortly afterwards was found by the police loitering round buckingham palace the authorities acted vigorously and without any trial or process of law shipped the boy jones off to sea a year later his ship put into portsmouth to refit and he at once disembarked and walked to london he was rearrested before he reached the palace and sent back to his ship the war spite on this occasion it was noticed that he had much improved in personal appearance and grown quite corpulent and so the boy jones passed out of history though we catch one last glimpse of him in eighteen forty four falling overboard in the night between tunis and algiers he was fished up again but it was conjectured, as one of the war spites officers explained in a letter to the Times, that his fall had not been accidental, but that he had deliberately jumped into the Mediterranean in order to see the life buoy light burning. Of a boy with such a record, what else could be supposed? But discomfort and alarm were not the only results of the mismanagement of the household the waste extravagance and peculation that also flowed from it were immeasurable there were preposterous perquisites and malpractices of every kind it was for instance an ancient and immutable rule that a candle that had once been lighted should never be lighted again what happened to the old candles nobody knew again the prince examining the accounts was puzzled by a weekly expenditure of thirty-five shillings on red room wine he inquired into the matter and after great difficulty discovered that in the time of george the third a room in windsor castle with red hangings had once been used as a guard room and that five shillings a day had been allowed to provide wine for the officers the guard had long since been moved elsewhere but the payment for wine in the red room continued the money being received by a half-pay officer who held the sinecure position of under butler after much laborious investigation and a stiff struggle with the multitude of vested interests which had been brought into being by long years of neglect the prince succeeded in effecting a complete reform the various conflicting authorities were induced to resign their powers into the hands of a single official the master of the household who became responsible for the entire management of the royal palaces great economies were made and the whole crowd of venerable abuses was swept away among others the unlucky half-pay officer of the red room was much to his surprise given the choice of relinquishing his weekly emolument or of performing the duties of an under butler even the irregularities among the footmen etc were greatly diminished there were outcries and complaints the prince was accused of meddling of injustice and of saving candle ends but he held on his course and before long the admirable administration of the royal household was recognized as a convincing proof of his perseverance and capacity at the same time his activity was increasing enormously in a more important sphere he had become the queen's private secretary her confidential adviser her second self he was now always present at her interviews with ministers. He took, like the Queen, a special interest in foreign policy, but there was no public question in which his influence was not felt. A double process was at work. While Victoria fell more and more absolutely under his intellectual predominance, he simultaneously grew more and more completely absorbed by the machinery of high politics the incessant and multifarious business of a great state nobody any more could call him a dilettante he was a worker a public personage a man of affairs 
Stockmar noted the change with exultation. The prince, he wrote, has improved very much lately. He has evidently a head for politics. He has become, too, far more independent. His mental activity is constantly on the increase, and he gives the greater part of his time to business without complaining. The relations between husband and wife, added the baron, are all one could desire. Long before Peel's ministry came to an end, there had been a complete change in Victoria's attitude toward him. His appreciation of the prince had softened her heart. The sincerity and warmth of his nature, which in private intercourse with those whom he wished to please had the power of gradually dissipating the awkwardness of his manners, did the rest. She came in time to regard him with intense feelings of respect and attachment. She spoke of our worthy Peel, for whom, she said, she had an extreme admiration, and who had shown himself a man of unbounded loyalty, courage, patriotism, and high-mindedness, and his conduct toward me has been chivalrous almost, I might say. She dreaded his removal from office almost as frantically as she had once dreaded that of Lord M. It would be, she declared, a great calamity. Six years before, what would she have said if a prophet had told her that the day would come when she would be horrified by the triumph of the Whigs? Yet there was no escaping it. She had to face the return of her old friends. In the ministerial crises of 1845 and 1846, the prince played a dominating part. Everybody recognized that he was the real center of the negotiations, the actual controller of the forces and functions of the crown. The process by which this result was reached had been so gradual as to be almost imperceptible, but it may be said with certainty that by the close of Peel's administration, Albert had become, in effect, the King of England. 6. With the final emergence of the Prince came the final extinction of Lord Melbourne. A year after his loss of office he had been struck down by a paralytic seizure. He had apparently recovered, but his old elasticity had gone forever. Moody, restless, and unhappy, he wandered like a ghost about the town, bursting into soliloquies in public places, or asking odd questions, suddenly, a propos de bottes. "'I'll be hanged if I do it for you, my lord,' he was heard to say in the hall at Brooks's, standing by himself and addressing the air after much thought. "'Don't you consider,' he abruptly asked a fellow guest at Lady Holland's, leaning across the dinner-table in a pause of the conversation, "'that it was a most damnable act of Henri IV to change his religion with a view to securing the crown?' He sat at home, brooding for hours in miserable solitude. He turned over his books, his classics and his testaments, but they brought him no comfort at all. He longed for the return of the past, for the impossible, for he knew not what, for the devilries of Caro, for the happy platitudes of Windsor. His friends had left him, and no wonder, he said in bitterness, the fire was out. He secretly hoped for a return to power, scanning the newspapers with solicitude, and occasionally making a speech in the House of Lords. His correspondence with the Queen continued, and he appeared from time to time at court, but he was a mere simulacrum of his former self. The dream, wrote Victoria, is past. As for his political views, they could no longer be tolerated. The Prince was an ardent free trader, and so, of course, was the Queen and when dining at Windsor at the time of the repeal of the Corn Laws, Lord Melbourne suddenly exclaimed, "'Ma'am, it is a damned dishonest act!' Everyone was extremely embarrassed. Her Majesty laughed and tried to change the conversation, but without avail. Lord Melbourne returned to the charge again and again with, "'I say, ma'am, it's damned dishonest!' until the Queen said, "'Lord Melbourne!' I must beg you not to say anything more on this subject now. And then he held his tongue. 
She was kind to him, writing him long letters and always remembering his birthday, but it was kindness at a distance, and he knew it. He had become poor Lord Melbourne. A profound disquietude devoured him. He tried to fix his mind on the condition of agriculture and the Oxford movement. He wrote long memoranda in utterly undecipherable handwriting. He was convinced that he had lost all his money and could not possibly afford to be a knight of the garter. He had run through everything, and yet, if Peel went out, he might be sent for. Why not? He was never sent for. The Whigs ignored him in their consultations, and the leadership of the party passed to Lord John Russell. When Lord John became Prime Minister there was much politeness, but Lord Melbourne was not asked to join the Cabinet. He bore the blow with perfect amenity, but he understood at last that that was the end. For two years more he lingered, sinking slowly into unconsciousness and imbecility. Sometimes, propped up in his chair, he would be heard to murmur, with unexpected appositeness, the words of Samson. So much I feel my general spirit droop, my hopes all flat. Nature within me seems in all her functions weary of herself. My race of glory run, and race of shame, and I shall shortly be with them that rest. A few days before his death, Victoria, learning that there was no hope of his recovery, turned her mind for a little towards that which had once been Lord M. "'You will grieve to hear,' she told King Leopold, "'that our good, dear old friend Melbourne is dying. One cannot forget how good and kind and amiable he was, and it brings back so many recollections to my mind.' though, God knows, I never wish that time back again. She was in little danger. The tide of circumstance was flowing now with irresistible fullness toward a very different consummation. The seriousness of Albert, the claims of her children, her own inmost inclinations, and the movement of the whole surrounding world combined to urge her forward along the narrow way of public and domestic duty. Her family steadily increased. Within eighteen months of the birth of the Prince of Wales, the Princess Alice appeared, and a year later the Prince Alfred, and then the Princess Helena, and two years afterwards the Princess Louise, and still there were signs that the pretty row of royal infants was not complete. The parents, more and more involved in family cares and family happiness, found the pomp of Windsor galling, and longed for some more intimate and remote retreat. On the advice of Peel, they purchased the estate of Osborne in the Isle of Wight. Their skill and economy in financial matters had enabled them to lay aside a substantial sum of money, and they could afford out of their savings not merely to buy the property, but to build a new house for themselves and to furnish it at a cost of two hundred thousand pounds. At Osborne, by the seashore and among the woods, which Albert, with memories of Rosenau in his mind, had so carefully planted, the royal family spent every hour that could be snatched from Windsor and London, delightful hours of deep retirement and peaceful work. The public looked on with approval. A few aristocrats might sniff or titter, but with the nation at large the Queen was now once more extremely popular. The middle classes, in particular, were pleased. They liked a love-match, they liked a household which combined the advantages of royalty and virtue, and in which they seemed to see reflected as in some resplendent looking-glass the ideal image of the very lives they led themselves. Their own existences, less exalted but oh so soothingly similar, acquired an added excellence, an added succulence from the early hours, the regularity, the plain tuckers, the round games, the roast beef and Yorkshire pudding of Osborne. It was indeed a model court. Not only were its central personages the patterns of propriety, but no breath of scandal, no shadow of indecorum might approach its utmost boundaries. For Victoria, with all the zeal of a convert, upheld now the standard of moral purity with an inflexibility surpassing, if that were possible, Albert's own. She blushed, 
to think how she had once believed, how she had once actually told him, that one might be too strict and particular in such matters, and that one ought to be indulgent toward other people's dreadful sins. But she was no longer Lord M.'s pupil. She was Albert's wife. She was more. The embodiment, the living apex of a new era in the generations of mankind. The last vestige of the eighteenth century had disappeared. Cynicism and subtlety were shriveled into powder. And duty industry, morality, and domesticity triumphed over them. Even the very chairs and tables had assumed, with a singular responsiveness, the forms of prim solidity. The Victorian age was in full swing. 7. Only one thing more was needed. Material expression must be given to the new ideals and the new forces, so that they might stand revealed in visible glory before the eyes of an astonished world. It was for Albert to supply this want. He mused and was inspired. The great exhibition came into his head. Without consulting any one, he thought out the details of his conception with the minutest care. There had been exhibitions before in the world, but this should surpass them all. It should contain specimens of what every country could produce, in raw materials, in machinery and mechanical inventions, in manufactures, and in the applied and plastic arts. It should not be merely useful and ornamental. It should teach a high moral lesson. It should be an international monument to those supreme blessings of civilization, peace, progress, and prosperity. For some time past the prince had been devoting much of his attention to the problems of commerce and industry. He had a taste for machinery of every kind, and his sharp eye had more than once detected, with the precision of an expert, a missing cogwheel in some vast and complicated engine. A visit to Liverpool, where he opened the Albert Dock, impressed upon his mind the immensity of modern industrial forces though in a letter to Victoria describing his experiences, he was careful to retain his customary lightness of touch. As I write, he playfully remarked, you will be making your evening toilette, and not be ready in time for dinner. I must set about the same task, and not let me hope with the same result. The loyalty and enthusiasm of the inhabitants are great, but the heat is greater still. I am satisfied that if the population of Liverpool had been weighed this morning, and were to be weighed again now, they would be found many degrees lighter. The docks are wonderful, and the mass of shipping incredible. In art and science he had been deeply interested since boyhood. His reform of the household had put his talent for organization beyond a doubt, and thus from every point of view the prince was well qualified for his task. Having matured his plans, he summoned a small committee and laid an outline of his scheme before it. The committee approved, and the great undertaking was set on foot without delay. Two years, however, passed before it was completed. For two years the prince labored with extraordinary and incessant energy. At first all went smoothly. The leading manufacturers warmly took up the idea the colonies and the East India Company were sympathetic, the great foreign nations were eager to send in their contributions, the powerful support of Sir Robert Peel was obtained, and the use of a site in Hyde Park selected by the Prince was sanctioned by the government. Out of 234 plans for the exhibition building, the Prince chose that of Joseph Paxton, famous as a designer of gigantic conservatories, and the work was on the point of being put in hand when a series of unexpected difficulties arose. Opposition to the whole scheme, which had long been smoldering in various quarters, suddenly burst forth. There was an outcry, headed by the Times, against the use of the park for the exhibition. For a moment it seemed as if the building would be relegated to a suburb, but after a fierce debate in the house, the supporters of the site in the park won the day. Then it appeared that the project lacked a sufficient financial backing, but this obstacle too was surmounted, and eventually £200,000 was subscribed as a guarantee fund. 
the enormous glass edifice rose higher and higher covering acres and enclosing towering elm trees beneath its roof and then the fury of its enemies reached a climax the fashionable the cautious the protectionists the pious all joined in the hue and cry it was pointed out that the exhibition would serve as a rallying point for all the ruffians in england for all the malcontents in europe and that on the day of its opening there would certainly be a riot and probably a revolution it was asserted that the glass roof was porous and that the droppings of fifty million sparrows would utterly destroy every object beneath it agitated nonconformists declared that the exhibition was an arrogant and wicked enterprise which would infallibly bring down god's punishment upon the nation colonel sibthorpe in the debate on the address prayed that hail and lightning might descend from heaven on the accursed thing the prince with unyielding perseverance and infinite patience pressed on to his goal his health was seriously affected he suffered from constant sleeplessness, his strength was almost worn out. But he remembered the injunctions of Stockmar, and never relaxed. The volume of his labors grew more prodigious every day. He toiled at committees, presided over public meetings, made speeches, and carried on communications with every corner of the civilized world, and his efforts were rewarded on may first eighteen fifty one the great exhibition was opened by the queen before an enormous concourse of persons amid scenes of dazzling brilliancy and triumphant enthusiasm victoria herself was in a state of excitement which bordered on delirium she performed her duties in a trance of joy gratitude and amazement and when it was all over her feelings poured themselves out into her journal in a torrential flood the day had been nothing but an endless succession of glories, or rather, one vast glory, one vast radiation of Albert. Everything she had seen, everything she had felt or heard, had been so beautiful, so wonderful, that even the royal underlinings broke down under the burden of emphasis, while her remembering pen rushed on regardless from splendor to splendor the huge crowds so well behaved and loyal flags of all the nations floating the inside of the building so immense with myriads of people and the sun shining through the roof a little side room where we left our shawls palm trees and machinery dear albert the place so big that we could hardly hear the organ thankfulness to god a curious assemblage of political and distinguished men the march from Italy. god bless my dearest albert god bless my dearest country a glass fountain the duke and lord anglesey walking arm in arm a beautiful amazon in bronze by kiss mr paxton who might be justly proud and rose from being a common gardener's boy sir george grey in tears and everybody astonished and delighted a striking incident occurred when after a short prayer by the archbishop of canterbury the choir of six hundred voices burst into the hallelujah chorus at that moment a chinaman dressed in full national costume stepped out into the middle of the central nave and advancing slowly towards the royal group did obeisance to her majesty the queen much impressed had no doubt that he was an eminent mandarin and when the final procession was formed orders were given that as no representative of the celestial empire was present he should be included in the diplomatic cortege he accordingly with the utmost gravity followed immediately behind the ambassadors he subsequently disappeared and it was rumored among ill-natured people that far from being a mandarin the fellow was a mere impostor but nobody ever really discovered the nature of the comments that had been lurking behind the matchless impassivity of that yellow face a few days later victoria poured out her heart to her uncle the first of may she said was the greatest day in our history the most beautiful and imposing and touching spectacle ever seen and the triumph of my beloved albert it was the happiest proudest day in my life and i can think of nothing else albert's dearest name is immortalized 
with this great conception, his own, and my own dear country showed she was worthy of it. The triumph is immense. It was. The enthusiasm was universal. Even the bitterest scoffers were converted and joined in the chorus of praise. Congratulations from public bodies poured in. The city of Paris gave a great fete to the exhibition committee, and the Queen and the Prince made a triumphal progress through the north of England. The financial results were equally remarkable. The total profit made by the exhibition amounted to a sum of a hundred and sixty-five thousand pounds, which was employed in the purchase of land for the erection of a permanent national museum in South Kensington. During the six months of its existence in Hyde Park, over six million persons visited it, and not a single accident occurred. But there is an end to all things, and the time had come for the Crystal Palace to be removed to the salubrious seclusion of Sydenham. Victoria, sad but resigned, paid her final visit. "'It looked so beautiful,' she said. I could not believe it was the last time I was to see it. An organ, accompanied by a fine and powerful wind instrument called the summerophone, was being played, and it nearly upset me. The canvas is very dirty, the red curtains are faded, and many things are very much soiled. Still the effect is fresh and new as ever, and most beautiful. The glass fountain was already removed, and the sappers and miners were rolling about the little boxes just as they did at the beginning. It made us all very melancholy. But more cheerful thoughts followed. When all was over she expressed her boundless satisfaction in a dithyrambic letter to the Prime Minister. Her beloved husband's name, she said, was forever immortalized and that this was universally recognized by the country was a source to her of immense happiness and gratitude. She feels grateful to Providence, Her Majesty concluded, to have permitted her to be united to so great, so noble, so excellent a prince, and this year will ever remain the proudest and happiest of her life. The day of the closing of the exhibition, which the Queen regretted much she could not witness, was the twelfth anniversary of her betrothal to the prince, which is a curious coincidence. End of chapter 4, part 3